And all right, we're here in Daniel chapter number seven, and uh, we are going to be uh, continuing what has been our Bible study for Sunday evenings on the subject of eschatology, on the subject of end times. And we looked at last week, last Sunday evening, uh, the subject of the kingdom of God. And this topic overlaps with uh, this particular subset of eschatology or uh, end times. And in this series, we've been diligently, in particular, studying uh, the book of Daniel. And one by one, we have looked at each of the visions of uh, Daniel, of the book of Daniel that he received from the Lord. And this morning, we're going to be looking at the final vision. And this is really going to be the climax to tie everything together. Any loose end um, is going to be tied up in a knot in this sermon this morning to make sense and to make sure we don't leave any uh, stone unturned. So this will by far be our most detailed revelation. That is Daniel chapter number seven. It's by far the most detailed revelation, but it'll be much easier to understand in light of the previous uh, visions that we looked at. And uh, in fact, there's a lot of overlaps. It's really the very same vision of the book of, of Revelation. Now, the title of the sermon this morning is The Four Beasts of Daniel and the Kingdom of God. The Four Beasts of Daniel and the Kingdom of God. And before I really get into this, I'd like to recapitulate or just um, review the guidelines that I gave when studying the subject of eschatology. And number one is the most basic one. It's the one that really uh, defines us as Christians. That is that, that Eschatology is not something to divide over, to break fellowship over. As I've put in the past, it's not something to crucify one another over, right? No pun intended. If you say that someone is not a Christian or is unsaved due to their eschatology, truly and really you are immature in the Christian faith. Now, Christianity is not judged based on our doctrine. Let's keep that in mind. Doctrine is important, but it's not judged based on your doctrine. How great of a Christian you are is based on your Christian character, your Christian character. And if you are under the impression that your Christianity is judged based on your doctrine, then you misunderstand doctrines in the New Testament because we're told as much. That is a teaching. That is a doctrine of the New Testament. The next thing is this. End times is difficult and deep. And I totally understand that different people are going to be working through this at different times. Different parts of it may make more sense to a di to a, you know some other person than uh, one person than another. So this is a deep topic. Be patient with fellow Christians uh, that maybe maybe you're ahead on this topic. Maybe things are clicking for you a little earlier and somebody else is kind of disagreeing with you. Be patient with that person. There was a time in which where you were standing where they are today. So be patient with them. Work through these things with them. Let's be gracious and patient to our fellow Christians on this topic. Furthermore, eschatology is, because it's so deep, something we should be less dogmatic about. That is that we should have an open mind uh, we should not have uh, an open mind beyond how far Scripture goes. When something is clear and you have hammered it down and you know that it's sure, then you need to, of course, hold on to that truth. But nonetheless, there are many parts of end times that are unclear. So uh, we need to uh, be less dogmatic when it comes to this subject. Now, don't forget that obviously there are particulars that we can be sure about. Generally speaking, end times is unclear in ways, right? But there are many particulars that we can hammer down and that we can make more sense of. Now, here we're in Daniel chapter number 7, and uh, right before we jump into it, I'm going to skip one section of the guidelines, but right before we jump into it, I want to give you a, a, a few certain or specific objectives that I have for this morning, uh, just to go ahead and, and let you know where we're headed. Number one is this. First and, foremost, first and foremost, excuse me, I'll show you that the vision of the four beasts has largely been fulfilled. The vision that we look at this morning in Daniel chapter number seven, I'm going to demonstrate to you that this vision has largely, there are details that have not, but largely been fulfilled. Number two is this. Again, we're going to see that the kingdom of God has come, present tense. Now, that should have been clear in the sermon that we looked at the other day, not because of my preaching, but because of the biblical evidence that shows that the kingdom of God has come. That is today in 2023, the kingdom is here and it is currently growing and expanding in the earth. Number three is this, the fourth or the four beasts in Daniel chapter number seven are going to overlap and be mirrors with the vision of Daniel two. That's the great statue. Okay, 
and with the vision of the ram and the goat. And I have, I have a visual for you because this can be detailed. I have a visual for you and we'll bring that out. You know, uh, when the time is at, or the time is at hand now, but when the time is fulfilled, we'll bring that out here in just a minute. But I want you to be able to compare each of these visions and to see that all three of them overlap with one another and that they mirror one another. All right, here in Daniel chapter number seven, we're going to work our way through this. I want you to look there with me um, at the beginning of the chapter, verse number one, Daniel chapter number seven, verse number one, and right here we get the context of Daniel chapter number seven. It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Verse 2, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. So right here in verse number one, we'll begin with, you kind of get the context, at least as far as the timing and the place. First of all, this is during the, the empire, the reign of Babylon, and it's the very last king of Babylon. You're given his name there in verse one, and that is Belshazzar. The place is that the vision occurs when Daniel is asleep, and this will often happen. It's not always the case, but it does, it does happen uh, many different times. Sometimes God will send a vision while a man is awake, and, and you'll see him fall into a trance, it will record. Um, but sometimes, like in uh, the case of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, God will send a vision in the form of a dream while someone is asleep. Like, as I said, the great statue that Nebuchadnezzar received uh, as a vision at night. We, so we see that he is asleep when he receives the vision. It says, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. So this is at night. It's when he is asleep. And it says, then he he awoke, of course, that he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matter. So he receives the vision while he is asleep at night. He wakes up. And of course, this is a part of the, the process of inspiration. God guides him in recording all of the details of the dream. Now, he wants to be clear to you that, that when, when Daniel awoke, and he records this, that he didn't miss any of the details because notice what it says at the very end of verse one. It says, and told, look what it says, the sum of the matters, okay? So that's saying all of the details, adding them together, right? It will talk about the sum of the people. It means that they're all added together. There's nothing that has been left out. Okay, verse number two, let's read that again together. The Bible says, Daniel spake and said, <clears throat> I saw in my vision by night. We see that reference that he's sleeping again. And behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Now, the four winds of heaven are, are obviously, evidently, referring to the four different compass directions. That is north, south, east, west. This is mentioned quite a few different times. And that plays into that, that word that's used there. It says the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. See, so strove there is the word for like something that's fighting, it's violent, it's saying that it's, it's denoting that it is beating upon the sea. There's some sort of a storm of some sort, okay, which is also why the four winds are mentioned, right? North, south, east, west, what's the point? It's trying to paint a picture that it's very windy. All four winds are blowing upon the sea and it says that they strove upon the sea. It's a picture that is being painted of chaos, you might say or violence, or of danger, okay? And then another thing that may not seem important to you, and you, you can't just read over these, these things. Every detail in Scripture matters. It's there for a reason. Daniel gives you the specific location of where they are. It says this, the great sea. It strove upon what? The great sea. The great sea in the Bible refers to what we call today the Mediterranean Sea. That is what the Great Sea is in Scripture. It's the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the Bible doesn't use that word Mediterranean, but it's very easy because we know the geography of the land of where Israel is to determine that the Great Sea is a reference to the Mediterranean Sea. Keep your hand there and turn over to Numbers chapter number 34. Numbers chapter number 34. So you can get a chance to look at this. <clears throat> 
Numbers chapter number 34, and we'll see that the Great Sea is a reference to the Mediterranean Sea. Now, if we, real quick while you turn there, just uh, think about this in your mind. Where is the Mediterranean Sea located in reference to Israel? It would be west, right? It would be located in the west of where Israel is located. And, uh, well, here, look at Numbers chapter number 34. I'll have you turn to another passage. I'll give you the other point. Numbers chapter number 34, verse 6 says this, And as for the western border, for uh, ye shall even have the great sea for a border. This shall be your west border. So this is when the children of Israel are... Are, uh, uh, they are settling in and they're being given the land of Israel. It's when they finally came in, they conquered the Canaanites, they're settling in. And I want you to notice that he's, he's naming off and detailing the geography of their land. And he tells them that what is going to be the border of where they are located is what? What is the great sea? The great sea. Flip over to Joshua, just a couple of books over. Joshua chapter number one, very first chapter, and look at verse number four. This is again where they are settling in. It's kind of a parallel passage with that written near the same time. <clears throat> Joshua chapter number one, look at verse number four. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, so it defines the river for you there, all the land of the Hittites and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. Now, where does the, the, the sun rise? It rises in the, and sets in the, why did everybody have that memorized? I'm sure that's how you learn that, right? So it's saying that the great sea is in the same location where the sun sets, right? And that is what direction? It is west. Now, why would they refer to it as the great sea? Well, there's other seas in that locality. What are some of the other seas? Uh, the Dead Sea, what's another one? Sea of Galilee, that's, I, yeah, it would, yeah, I didn't even think of that one. I had the other two down, and I was trying to think of what I had. I had down Sea of Galilee, that's a good one, and then the Red Sea. Now, which is the greatest of those seas, as in the largest? Mediterranean, by far. So why would they refer to it as the Great Sea? Because it's the largest sea of all of the seas that are in that location. So, uh, so you know, in this vision, particularly, Daniel sees these beasts rising up out of what is the Mediterranean Sea, what we would think of today as the Mediterranean Sea. And there are the, these four beasts, and we'll look at them in just a moment, but the, but the wind is blowing from all directions. Why does it say that? Because it's violent, because it's chaos. Because there is destruction that is coming. It's boisterous, right? You, like the, the Bible uses the word of it being tempestuous. It's a, it's a horrible storm that is blowing. And that's why it also says that it strove upon the sea. It's almost like a fighting upon the sea. So this is the vision. Try to paint the picture in a vision in your mind the same way in which Daniel saw this, right? Okay, now go back with me and let's look at verse number three. <clears throat> Verse number three, and I'm going to try to hang in there. I'm sure you can notice that. I'm losing my voice slowly. Already was, but it's getting a little worse already, so pray for me. Verse number three here, um, it says, And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Now, again, we see the word great. So there are four of them. We know that. And it says that they are great beasts. Now, beast is a word that is used like we would use the word animal. Okay, I have some pictures of them over there, and uh, my son Titus uh, had this, uh, when I was preparing it, he saw what I was doing, and he said, he asked me, Daddy, why do you have an animals on the poster? So we would use the word animal today. Okay, I already had that down there as a description, but nonetheless, it wouldn't just be a animal, it would be, or an animal, it would be a wild animal. The word beast in, in the Bible is a word that is used for animals such as lions, Animals also that would be like a tiger. That would be another animal. It's, it's referring to an animal that is not tamed. It's referring to an animal that is very dangerous. Okay? Like, really, the lion is a perfect example of that. That is what it will typically refer to as uh, a beast. Now, it's used in other ways, but oftentimes that is a, a typical way in which beast is used in the Bible. Now, it's great. What does it mean by great? What does great sea mean? Yeah, large. I mean, so these beasts are not small. They're very, they're very large animals. They're large, and typically it's used for, you know, dangerous animals. And then it tells you this. It says that they are diverse one from another. So like a lion, for example, it wasn't four lions that came up, okay? There are four different beasts, large, great beasts that arise out of the sea. It wasn't four tigers, okay? 
Um, now look with me here in, in verse number four now. So we kind of got the idea of what it sees, the, you know, of what he sees in this vision. The, the, the wind is beating on the, on the Mediterranean Sea. He's looking out and watching this. Um, you know, you, you know, it could be like some kind of storm with it raining, but it's, it's boisterous. It's, it's blowing hard, strove upon the sea, and these four great beasts rise up out of the sea. Now, in verse number four, we begin to get the description of each of these. And we're going to work our way kind of quickly through um, verse four through verse seven, I believe it is, uh, where we look at each of these animals, each of these beasts that rise up out of the sea. And then we'll get to the interpretation uh, here in a minute. So look with me at verse four. It says, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man. And a man's heart was given to it. Verse 5. So that was the first beast. Verse 5. I beheld another beast, the second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side and had it three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Verse 6. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. <clears throat> and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Verse 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold... In this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, of man, and a mouth speaking great things. All right, so we see the four beasts. There's a little bit more detail given with the fourth beast, so we're going to spend more time on the fourth beast here in just a minute. But we'll begin and walk back through each of these very quickly. So the very first one is found in verse 4, and that is the first beast. And the very first beast is, we're told, a lion. So the first beast that he sees... So there is somewhat of, a, of, a, of an order to this. They are named in order. It says, it, we're told that it is a lion. But it's not just a normal lion. It says that it is a lion that has wings on its back, okay? And specifically, what kind of wings are they? They're eagle's wings. So we're not told with the leopard. He also has wings, but we're told with the lion that the wings that are on the lion's back, that these are eagle's wings. So he has e a lion that has eagle's wings, on its back. And while he's watching this, while he's he's looking and watching in this vision, he says, I beheld till the wings were plucked. So he's watching. You can imagine this lion, this great big beast of a lion. It says the wings are plucked. And it says that a man's heart was given to it. So after the wings are plucked off of the lion, a man's heart is given to it. And then it stands upright. That would be a weird you know, sight to see. It stands upright like a man stands. So it's meant to symbolize the fact that when it's given a man's heart that it stands upright, okay? That causes it to stand upright and to look and appear like what? Like a man, like a human, right? As if it's behaving no longer as a beast, but like a man. Okay, the second beast, that's found if you follow along there in verse number five. The second beast is in verse number five is the bear, okay? He says he looks and then there's a second beast and this is a bear, and it's represented as being, and this is really important, we'll see why in a minute, we'll get to the interpretation, but it says that it's raised up on one side. So when it's walking, okay, you can kind of picture, and the way that I was describing this to my daughter the other day, so they get to hear my sermons, you know, before I, get, I preach them here, that if you think of like how a cat will walk, right, or a lion walks, you ever notice how their, how their shoulders will kind of shift up and down, and you can see it kind of raise 
back and forth. That's kind of how I picture the bear, because you can see this with bears as well. Not as much, but you can see it if you look closely, where one side is kind of raised up higher. Okay, like almost like it's, you know, in the vision, Daniel seeing this bear stepping, but one side purposely to communicate, you know, a truth is raised up a little bit higher than the other side. And then it mentions as well that there are three ribs in the mouth of this bear. Okay, so, so it has just gone forth and it's, and it has done what? Well, what do they yell to it? It says that someone, that someone says to the bear, uh, devour much flesh. I think it says arise. Is that how it's worded? Yes, arise, devour much flesh. So this bear goes forth, and what does it do? It brings destruction. It is, you know, it has, it gets dominion over the other beasts, over the other animals. All right, look at verse six now. This is the third beast. Real quick pause. We'll take a vote. Is it? Am I the only one that's hot in here? Because I'm up here preaching. Brother Rick is hot. Will you will you turn it down a little bit? Brother Rick's got it. He, he must have been hot. He got up immediately to turn that thing down. Um, so the third beast we find in verse 6, and it is a leopard, okay? And the leopard, it says, has wings as well. But it doesn't just have, it doesn't tell you that it's eagle's wings. It mentions that it's wings of a fowl. And how many wings does it have? It has four wings. That's not typical, is it? So there's obviously something that's being communicated here, and then it doesn't just have two wings like a bird would have like the lion had, it says that it has four wings, okay? It has two sets of wings. It has four wings, and remember, this is a leopard. But then it also gives us another detail, and that's what? It has four heads. So we, we look out and you see this leopard, okay? And this leopard has four different heads coming out of it. What a dreadful sight, really, if you were to see something like this. In reality, I mean, it'd be terrifying. So you see this leopard, it's got four heads, and then it also on its back has four wings, two sets of wings, okay? That's the third beast. Then we get to the fourth beast. That's verse 7 and verse 8. Verse 7 and verse 8, we get details about the fourth beast, okay? It doesn't tell you exactly what kind of animal that it is, but we get more details about it in the book of Revelation. But here in, in this case, what we are told about the beast is that it is strong exceedingly. It says that it's diverse from all the other beasts, okay? So it stands out, it's more terrifying, it's stronger than all of the other beasts. It's one thing repeatedly that's emphasized. If you look down there at verse 7 and verse 8, it stamps the residue with its feet, it crushes the whole earth. The language is emphasizing that it's diverse and that it's greater and stronger and bigger and larger and more fearful than all of the other beasts. And it says also that it has great iron teeth. Okay, what again? It's speaking to its power, its might, its strength, and that it just stamps the residue with its feet. Now, while he's watching this, it also says that it has 10 horns. Okay, so he's looking, all right, and this makes more sense when we see in the book of Revelation that there's seven heads, but it says that there are 10 horns on this thing. There are 10 horns that are on the head of this beast or of this animal. And then it tells you that while Daniel is watching, oh, Michaela, uh, while uh, he's watching this, it says that a little horn pops up. So there's the 10 horns, and then also a little horn pops up. Now, um, it also gives you another detail. We're going to go through and explain all of this. But you have the 10 horns. Duck down a little bit, buddy. You have the 10 horns, and then the little horn pops up, and it says that there were three other horns that were by, by that little horn that were plucked up by the root. So he, so he destroyed three kings that came before him. He defeated three other kings at some point, okay, uh, that had come before him. So there we get the, the, the four beasts throughout you know, that particular rundown of verses 4 through 8. Okay, so we see verse 4 through 8, and we get the four beasts there. Now, now what we're going to do is, we're, the very first thing we're going to do is look at the interpretation of each of these four beasts, because it gives it to us. We're going to look at what the four beasts are first. Now, skip down to verse 15 through 17. Verse 15 through 17. We'll look at the interpretation that we get here, and then we're going to compare some visions 
and get a little more information in just a moment. Look at verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit <clears throat> in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. So this is during the time of the vision, and he is... It's so interesting how this happens so many different times where he's able to interact within while he's, he's receiving the vision. He is able to, you know, say that it troubled him during the vision and then he approaches and he makes the conscious choice to approach this angel and ask him what is the interpretation, interpretation, excuse me, of all of this. Now look at verse 17. He begins to interpret it. These great beasts, which are four, are for kings which shall arise out of the earth. Verse 18, But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Okay, so we, we, we get the basics of what this is right here, okay? He gives us the details of what these four beasts represent, and uh, that's, a, that's a, 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 a huge revelation of all of this, a pivotal piece of knowledge that we must know, and that is that each of the beasts represent four kings. Now, don't forget that kings in the Bible also, the things that represent kings represent what? Kingdoms. So it would be a quick, rash, easy mistake yet to make to think that these are each just four kings in and of themselves and maybe four kings within one kingdom. But I'm going to show you that each of these beasts are four kingdoms, that they represent four kingdoms. Now, first of all, notice there in verse 17, if you look down, it says, These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Then verse 18, it says, But the saints of the Most High shall take the what? Shall take the kingdom. So notice that, the, that it's using kings and kingdom interchangeably right here in 17 and 18. Flip over to Daniel chapter number 2. And I'll show you again where this happens within the book of Daniel. That is that a certain... A certain uh, uh, analogy or metaphor, a prop, like a beast, it will represent a king, but it will also represent an entire kingdom. Look at Daniel chapter number 2, and I'll give you an example of this. Verse number 37, this is where we saw the statue. Verse 37, it says, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom. Power and strength and glory. Verse 38, And whatsoever the, wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Now verse 39, watch this. And after thee shall arise another kingdom. Notice he doesn't say shall arise another king. He says after thee shall arise another, another kingdom. So what is he talking about? He's talking about a king and a kingdom at the same time. Now, go back to Daniel chapter number 7, and I'll show you it even more clearly here in Daniel chapter 7. So Daniel 7, 17, where we read, it said, These great beasts which are four are four kings. Look at Daniel 7, verse 23. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the what? The fourth kingdom upon the earth. So notice that the four beasts represent four kings, but that they also, at the very same time, just like the statue, represent four kingdoms. He says, hey, the four beasts are four kings. But then he also, when he goes to talk about one of those four beasts, he says the fourth beast is the fourth what? Not just king, the fourth kingdom that shall be upon the earth. Now, again, this, this happens a few other times throughout Scripture. Actually, many other times if we include all of the just discussions that take place with Israel. But it's because the king is the head of the kingdom, right? You know, it kind of puts flesh on it with the statue. That is that Nebuchadnezzar represents what? When you think of Babylon, what do you think of most of the time? You think of, of Nebuchadnezzar himself, right? Because he's the head of that kingdom, literally. He's the one, it's a monarch, he rules over it. His face is, you know, what represents or symbolizes that kingdom. So God will speak of the kingdom, but he'll also speak of the king of the kingdom as well. That is to talk about the kingdom. 
So the four beasts are four kingdoms that are upon the earth, just as we saw in Daniel chapter number two. Now in Daniel chapter number two, we get a little bit of information as well. We see that the four kingdoms that are in Daniel chapter number two are kingdoms where they arise one after the next. Okay, they don't all arise or come all at one time. However, there's some language that could be real confusing. That is, during the time of the, of the fourth kingdom, the Christ comes. Okay, but how is it worded? It says, in the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom on the earth. All right, but did he come at the time of Nebuchadnezzar? Because we're plainly told that Nebuchadnezzar is the head. No, he's not, right? Right, so don't forget, so we're building on a lot of the knowledge. Don't forget that there is a continuity of one kingdom that is passed down from, it's the kingdoms of the Gentiles, the kingdoms of the earth where they're ruling over all the earth. It's one kingdom that is basically passed down to a different people group or, or another nation. Remember when Persia comes into Babylon, what does it say? It says that they come in, it says, and they took the kingdom. They took the kingdom. So now who is the king of kings? It's no longer Nebuchadnezzar. Who is it? It would be Darius. All right. Think about it from the perspective. If you were a, if you were a citizen that lived in India, okay, does a lot change? Uh, you know, you're paying taxes to, to, to Neb, but then Darius comes in and what happens? Now you're just paying taxes to another guy. The kingdom's the same. It's the same kingdom. It's just the kingdom of the earth. It's the kingdom of the Gentiles that's ruling over. So that's why it says that he came in and he took the kingdom. So what we see is one beast arising, defeating the other beast, and just taking over their infrastructure, essentially. Just taking over the existing kingdom. Darius comes in and he took the kingdom from Nebuchadnezzar. That's why the statue has a continuity to it. That's why all of the kingdoms are mentioned at the same time. They're each of these beasts. It's the kingdom of men or the kingdom of the earth. So there's a connection between each of these kingdoms. So you got to be careful for a few different reasons when interpreting the visions and uh, especially when it comes to regarding the timing. And as I said, for example, the great image with Daniel 2, whose head is gold, you can look and see each kingdom. And in one sense, they are all present there in the vision at the same time, aren't they? They're all, you can look and see each of them, but are all four of them reigning at the exact same time? No, because it tells you every time that it mentions the next kingdom, it tells you that they reign over all the earth. So how could each of the kingdoms be reigning over all the earth and be contemporaneous with one another? That is, be ruling on the earth at the same time. They couldn't be. So it's one after the next, after the next, after the next. That's the same thing that we have here. We have the lion that is the first kingdom. Notice that there is an order that is given. There's an order that's given here. We have a lion that is mentioned. That is the first kingdom. Then we have a bear that's mentioned. What's it called? There's an order for a reason. It says this is the second kingdom. Then we have another beast that arises. It's a leopard. This is the third kingdom. And then finally, lastly, there is a fourth beast that comes out of the sea, and it is the fourth kingdom. There's a purpose for the order. And guess what? Over in Daniel chapter number 2, they are in order as well. And guess what? They're not all on the earth at the same time. First, and they're actually referred to as that. Second, third, and it says, and the fourth is the fourth kingdom that shall be upon the earth. So there is an order of one after the next after the next. That's why when the bear arises, he devours much flesh. What does he do? He treads down the beast that was before him, which would be the kingdom that is on the earth, before him. So all four of these beasts, this is the point, all four of these beasts, beasts are empires on the earth. They are successive. The first beast is on the earth and then it is conquered by the second beast. Okay? And then the third beast is the third kingdom that comes and it conquers the second kingdom that was before it. Lastly, the fourth beast that's on the earth, it comes and it conquers the third that is before it. So these are four beasts that live one after the next, after the next, or four kingdoms that reign upon the earth. And verse 23 tells you an order. 
it tells you, look at what it says in verse 23. So if that wasn't enough for you, then look at verse 23. It says, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom, what? Upon the earth. There is an order to these beasts. That's why they're called first, second, third, fourth. It is the fourth kingdom that shall be upon the earth. So we are given a clear order of, of these. And there's a reason why there's a numerical designation of each of them. Okay, And it tells you that the fourth kingdom shall devour the whole earth and tread it down and break it into pieces. It is the new world superpower. This is the same thing. The Gentiles of the earth, uh, the kingdom of the Gentiles, the kingdoms of the earth. You could even say the kingdoms of men. It's a continuous kingdom that's passed down. Power is just passed down from each one. Now, real quick, let me ask you what were... What, what was the order of the kingdoms on the earth of the statue? What was the very first one we're given it? Nebuchadnezzar, and it would be Babylon. What was the, the second kingdom that came after it? It would be Persia. And then the third kingdom is Greece. And then the fourth kingdom would be Rome. That would be what time did, did the Christ come? And we can easily walk these out. There's a few ways that we can look at this, and we're going to see that in a minute. But we identified it already with that individual vision. When he sees the statue, it begins at the top. Babylon, second is Persia, third is Greece, fourth is Rome. That's who each of these are if we start at the top and we walk each of these down. Okay, I'm going to bring in the visual now at this point. So this should help to clear some things up. It's not as, uh, not to say the other ones are the best quality. Brother Rick, do you mind checking to see if this thing is, is, can be seen in that? All right, you guys probably can't see it that well either. But I'm going to explain the poster to you, and then if you'd like to, you can see it afterwards. Typically, I have a much larger poster than this. But, um, that's, that's good? If you can't see it, then... That's definitely not going to Maybe they can zoom in. Okay, so this right here, what we have are the three visions. This is going to be the most important part here for a minute. And that is to understand what this represents. This right here is the great statue of Daniel chapter number two. This is the great image that we see in Daniel chapter number two. And lastly, in Daniel two, we see the stone that crushes the feet of this image. So that represents the stone. This is the image of Daniel two, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, and then here in the middle is what we're looking at right now. This is the four beasts of Daniel. So we see the four beasts of Daniel here, and we're going to look here in a minute, but we see the clouds. I had that represent. I chose the clouds because it says that he, he sees the Son of Man come with clouds to the Ancient of Days, and he's given power and authority. So that is the, the last. That's, that represents, you might say, the kingdom of God. Okay, This is when, he, when the Christ or the Messiah is given power and authority uh, uh, and the kingdom of God is established. So you see the lion, the bear, you see the leopard, and then you see the fourth beast with iron teeth, the seven-headed dragon. All right, now over here, we haven't looked at it just yet. We're going to compare some scriptures right now, though. Is Daniel 7, I'm sorry, Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. Okay, this is Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel 9. Remember that Daniel 8, which is Daniel's 70th week, is the interpretation of Daniel 8. Uh, excuse me, I'm screwing you all up. I, I may have said it right, but Daniel 9 is the interpretation of the vision of Daniel 8. I may have said it right, I may not have, but Daniel 9 is the interpretation of the vision of Daniel 8. This was the vision of Daniel 8. So at the top you have the ram that comes, where one and if you come up here and look real close, you can tell. The, the one horn is a little bit larger than the other horn, right? Then you have the goat that has the great horn. And then here is the goat where the one is broken and then four come up in its place. So right here, it zooms in on its head. And you have the four horns that come up after the great horn is broken. And then right here is just another adaptation of that. I'm going to walk you all through this here in a minute. The four horns and then the red one right there that I highlighted is the little horn that comes up as well following that. Now what I want to do is I want to walk through each of these visions at the same time. And I want to show you how tightly they overlap 
and how they are, they are speaking of the same revelation. The very first thing that's super important is to understand that the, of the theme of this. Okay, so get there in your Bible in Daniel chapter number 7. And I want you to, you, you have to understand what is the theme of all of these visions. They're all building to the same thing. And that is that they are building to the coming kingdom of God. The only reason why all of these beasts are mentioned is that they are all working their way towards and they are answering the question of when the kingdom of God will come and when the Messiah will come. Each of them, the stone, you have the, the, you know, the, the Son of Man coming with clouds, and then you also have in Daniel 70th week, Daniel 8 and Daniel 9, the anointing of the Messiah. They are building, it says, quote, they're building the kingdom to the prince. It's the time of the coming of the Messiah. It says that during the 70 weeks that they will anoint the most high. All of it has to do with when the kingdom is coming, when the Messiah is coming, and when he will be anointed. I'll show you this. Look at Daniel chapter 2. We're going to come back to Daniel 7, but look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. This is the climax of all of it. This is what it's all building to. This is the theme, you might say, or the thrust and idea of the whole Bible. Daniel 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever and ever. Daniel chapter number 7. We have there, go back with me to Daniel chapter number 7. In verse number 17, it says, These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Now look at verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. So what is it building towards? What is it wanting? Why are even the four beasts mentioned? Because they are being used as a landmark, you might say, until or pointing to the time when the kingdom of God comes. Look at verse 21. The whole, the whole rest of the chapter is about this. It kind of goes over the details three or four times. Look at verse 21. I beheld in the same horn, made war with the saints, and prevailed against them. Verse 22, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Look at verse 24. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings. So he's just, he's just kind of reiterating these different details or points. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first and shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and dividing of times. Now, now importantly, verse 26. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his kingdom to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him that is the exact same language and the exact same wording that is used in daniel chapter number two as well that his kingdom will come and when it comes it is an everlasting kingdom they won't give it to another people it will be an eternal continual reign at that time when the kingdom of God comes. So what's the theme of all of it? It is that this is when the kingdom of God is come. All these details are given in order to be able to show you and to reveal to you when the kingdom of God will come. It's the conclusion of all of the visions of Daniel. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I want to go through each of these chart uh, or each of these parts of the chart with you. get a drink before I step away. And so you can line up each of them. And I want you to see how tightly that each of them fit, not just some of them. You can use land markers. We can start at the top and work our way down. We can start at the back and work our way, or the bottom, I'm sorry, and work our way up. Like each of them fit that tightly. So look at, um, we'll start with the first beast. Is, should I stay on this side or that side, Brother Rick? You were... This side? Okay. So the, look, let's look at the first beast, because we're going to start where we are here in Daniel chapter number 7. And remember that the first beast is, <clears throat> is the lion with wings. Now, that, we're told, is the first kingdom. 
Okay. We're also given four kingdoms with the statue. Now, who would that line up with when it comes to the statue or the great image? Who was the first kingdom? Who was it represented as? Nebuchadnezzar. It would be Babylon. Okay. Now let's look at some of the details of this beast because we're, we are po just pointedly told, categorically told. It's not implicit. It's explicit. It just says that Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon is the head of gold. So here we have a reference. Now let's look at the first beast here and see if we can identify. The very first thing is this. The beast is depicted as a lion. What does a lion represent in the Bible? When something is represented as a lion, what is it meant to represent it as? A king. There is a title that is given to Nebuchadnezzar when it tells you that he is the head. And what does it say that he is? The king of kings. That's the very first thing that it says. Now, this is interesting, which you can look this up if you'd like. But, but Nebuchadnezzar him, depicted himself repeatedly as a lion. There are all sorts of pictures on the walls in the, ba in the Babylonian uh, 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 or of the Babylonian, ancient Babylonian city. You may have seen it where Nebuchadnezzar, it's his head and it's like seated on a lion. So he would depict himself as a lion even, which that in and of itself is interesting. Christ is called the lion of the tribe of Judah because he is the king. A lion is the king of the jungle and specifically it says it it causes Nebuchadnezzar to stand out of all of these kingdoms because it says that he is the king of kings. We see the lion being used for that, and the lion is what? Again, the king. Okay. Not only that, we're given some other information about him. We see it has, he has eagle's wings. There's wings on the leopard, but we're particularly told, namely, what those wings represent, and it says eagle's wings. What's the other thing that happens to this lion? Because these details matter. It's meant to reveal things to you. What happens to the lion? Right. What, I couldn't hear you, Brother Hall. Wings are out. The wings are plucked. And then it says that at that, a part of that same event, he says, I beheld till the wings were plucked. And it says, and a man's heart was given unto it. And it tells you what that means. It, it causes the lion to stand up and to behave like a human. <laughs> heart there is referring to the mind. It's referring to our ability to reason. Okay. And this should bring to mind immediately the event that took place with Nebuchadnezzar. And there's none other like it in Scripture, and it points you to it. Not, Daniel chapter number 4, verse 31, this is what Daniel's alluding to. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men. And thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field." And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men. Notice what it refers to the kingdom as there too, the kingdom of men. And giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men and did eat <clears throat> grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles, Feathers. Isn't that interesting? His hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the days, I, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the, in the army of heaven. It says this in verse 36. At that same time, my reason returned unto me. So what took place was that in the very beginning, what was he given? The heart of a beast. But in the end, you know, his hair that was like eagle's hair, his claws that grew out like, like a bird's claws, okay? God plucked all of that, and then he took... His, his, you know, his heart that he had taken away of a man's heart, he gave it back to him. And guess what? He was on the ground, it says, eating like, like an ox. But then when he was given a man's heart, what happened? He stood up, upright like a man. What does the lion do? The king of kings? He stands up. after the. He's no longer a beast is the picture. The wings are taken away. He's no longer an eagle. He's no longer a lion. He stands up and it says that his reason returned unto him. His understanding comes back to him. He's no longer behaving like an animal. So you can see how closely this lines up. The first, this is the first king, first kingdom as well, 
first king, first kingdom here as well, clearly picturing what is Babylon. Okay, let's look at the second kingdom and see how, how well this pictures. I'm going to stay on this side. Let's look at the second kingdom and see how well that it um, uh, lines up. Now, we're, we're told, first of all, what the second kingdom is from Scripture. We're told in Daniel, I believe it's Daniel 5, if anyone, you know, uh, remembers that. Daniel 5, at the very end of Daniel chapter number 5, is where the Persians come in and it says, and they took the kingdom, right? The Persians come in, so if this, if we can identify this clearly as Babylon, it says that the Persians come in and they took the kingdom. So we can know that, let's plug that in and say, hey, this is Persia right here that comes right after. And you say, well, how do you know that the bear represents Persia? Okay, well, if we're right about, about the line, then it, we should be able to find a couple of things that make sense, that point us to you know, the lion representing or making, you know, representing or symbolizing the nation of Persia. Well, let's compare it to the other one because that is the vision of Daniel chapter number eight. You have the ram and the goat. Now, what does the ram start with? What, is the, what does the ram represent? Persia. So the vision itself starts with Persia. We don't have Babylon. So you can notice how, you know, the lion is left out in this vision. So it's moved forward in time a little bit, and he doesn't mention the first kingdom, that is Babylon. He just starts with the kingdom, which is Persia, and it's plainly identified for us. We're told that the ram is, is Persia. Flip over to uh, Daniel chapter number 8. Look at Daniel chapter number 8 with me. So flip over in your Bible, if you could, to Daniel chapter number 8, and look at... I can't remember which verse it is, and I don't have it here. Does anybody see it in front of him? It's like verse 3 or 4. Maybe a little bit after that, where, it, where, it's, where it's talking about the ram. Verse 4. Okay, so remember this about the second beast. It tells us this. Real quick before we read verse 4. It says that the bear has the ribs in its mouth, and it says devour much flesh. It's supposed to go forward and devour much flesh. So this is the new kingdom on the earth. But it tells us something real specific about it. Do you remember how the cat walks, how the bear's walking? It says that it's what? It's raised up on one side. It says that it's higher on one side than the other side. Okay? Somebody read. I don't have it in front of me. So somebody read verse 4 where it's mentioning and it's describing the ram. Verse 3, it says, Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Okay, so you have a clear reference to the two or the two sides as, as uh, Daniel 7 is, is, is you know, dividing the beast into, right? And it says that the other side, there's two sides, the other side or the one side of the lion is raised up what? Higher than the other. What do we see with the ram? It has two sides. It has two horns that are representing what? The two kingdoms of really the two sub kingdoms of the one. Remember Persia and the Medes came together and they were basically one kingdom that was divided into the two. And then the Persians won out later. What was the greatest of the two? It was Persia. That's why the one horn is higher than the other horn. The bear that comes after the lion would be who? Persia. Right? So you have this duality with this other kingdom where it's two sides. One side's higher. The ram, one side's higher, lines up perfectly. Now, what's interesting is how the anatomy of the great statue works out so well. And I'm going to show you something else here in just a minute. But at the point of the body wherein you have the silver, guess what you also have that you're told specifically is a part of the silver? The two arms. So it's, it's, it's so interesting how the anatomy of this just breaks down so perfectly. You have the two sides where one is higher than the other. You have the two, and so it's, it's emphasizing this two where the horn is a little bit higher than the other. Then you have what? Two arms representing the originality of the kingdom. The, the, initially it is what? The Persians and the Medes. And it's called that throughout scripture over and over again. Okay, so now what would be the third kingdom? Well, we have it clearly identified for us in, again, where you are, Daniel chapter number 8. And that would be the third kingdom is Grecia. Now, it just continues to stay like this tight and just and be extremely uniform. Like each of these to line up perfectly in harmony. Okay? The third beast 
of Daniel chapter number seven is described as a leopard. And this leopard, we're told first, we're told first that the leopard has four wings. Now, what's the difference between all of these animals here as far as, uh, you know, strength? You might pick the lion in one sense, okay? And you would work through it. They would all have a defining characteristic, okay? What would be the defining characteristic? Because they're diverse from one another that would cause the leopard to stand out. Well, it would be four wings and four heads, yes. But as far as like those animals, if you, if you wanted to like have a race, with these. That's what I'm getting at. Maybe I was too general. You know, I was probably going to get that. I was in my own head. Okay. But um, you would pick the leopard. A leopard is known for its speed, at least among these animals. Of course, a cheetah would be faster, but nonetheless, the leopard among these animals would be the fastest. And not only is it, is it depicting as a leopard, but what does it have on its back? Not only two wings, four wings. Yeah. It says that it has four wings on its back. Now look at um, look there in Daniel. I, I kept you there purposely. Look there in Daniel, chapter number eight. Look at verse number five. So now this is the goat. So the goat would be what lines up with this four-headed leopard. Let's see how well it lines up. It says, "And and as I was considering, behold, an he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth." And then notice what it says, "And touched not." the ground. So what's this he goat doing? It's flying, right? Almost like it has wings, right? Almost like it has four wings on its back. And this is meant to represent, we're told, the kingdom of Grecia. And what Greece stood out when it comes to all kingdoms that have been on this earth is how swiftly, specifically under the reign of Alexander the Great, he conquered all of the earth. Just in a very short time period, he just started in Greece and then just ran through and conquered the entire earth. So it's meant to represent the speed of the kingdom of Greece. That's why it's a leopard. And then in addition to that, he not only has two wings, it says that he has four wings, four wings. But furthermore, it doesn't end there. Because what happens, the, 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 first, the first horn represents particularly the king of Grecia, who is Alexander the Great, the first king, it tells you, so it's, it's for sure Alexander the Great, but what happens to that? It tells you that it prematurely is what? Broken. And it's t it says that he dies and that he's not able to give the kingdom to his posterity. He had no children, okay? And then what happens? What comes up in place of that one horn? Four. So that one's broken, and then four horns come up on the head of the goat. That's this circle right here. So you have the transformation. That's why I tried to draw the green line. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a small green line from the goat. It's got the big great horn that's larger than all the other horns, but then it, it changes. What happens is that horn is broken, and then in its place, four horns come up. And it says that the kingdom is divided. Now, we're told what these kingdoms are. We, 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 we know throughout history, we're told that specifically not the name of the kingdoms, because it was many years before that. But we're told that it's divided towards the four winds of heaven. So they're divided. Well, what, what, in history, we're told what they are. Like specifically, we know through history. In studying, we know that when Alexander the Great died, his generals fought over the kingdom. And I can't remember what the name of the war is. There's a particular name for this war, like Dia something. And what took place was, I thought he was going to tell me for a minute. What took place was um, the four generals just ended up settling and they took over the four quadrants of the kingdom. You probably, I'm sure you can't see this because I barely can from here. But down here we also have the four horns in this other picture. And it tells you each of them. Seleucid and then Lysimachus, I think it is, Cassander, and then the Ptolemaic Empire. Ptolemy was the general that was in, it's very famous because Cleopatra came from Ptolemy. Okay, uh, Ptolemy was in Egypt. So that's what those four horns represent. Now back to the four beasts. We see that it's the leopard, it's swift, it has the four wings on its head. Uh, I'm sorry, four wings on its back. But what else does it have? There's four wings, but it also has four heads. It's a four-headed beast. What do the horns and the heads represent? 
They represent the kings of the kingdom, just like the horns will. Yeah, well, yeah, it's right. They represent the kings of that kingdom, right? So the four heads represent that this kingdom is going to be divided into four. Well, what happened with the goat? You see how each one of them just uniformly in a very specific manner have all the same representations and they're revealed all in the same way, showing you that starting at the top or the bottom, like I said, they all line up perfectly. The four-headed leopard has the four wings and it's meant to be swift and fast, just like the goat with the great horn that's broken and then the four horns come up in its place. Okay, so you can see how that lines up perfectly. All right, um, then the next beast, and in Daniel, we're not given all the details of it. We see more in Revelation, like I said. So I just used that picture. But we have the, I'm just going to call it the fourth beast. We have the fourth beast, which it says is great and terrible. So it's different than the other beast. It's more, it's, it's more uh, 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 terrifying, able, like it says, terrible in Daniel 2. It's more terrible. It's, it brings more terror and more fear. That's why, you know, it makes sense that it's the seven-headed dragon, right? But this beast in particular, we're given information about. We're told details about this beast, okay? So look there in Daniel chapter number seven. Daniel chapter number seven, it tells you in verse number seven, and this is a little bit down. I have an ellipsis here, so it's like, it's like maybe B or C of that verse, but you can find my place here, Daniel chapter seven, verse seven. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces. So the fourth kingdom, we're told, is great and terrible. It's exceedingly powerful, exceedingly strong, and we're told a specific detail about it. When he sees it in this image, it says that it has great iron teeth. Now flip over to Daniel 2, and let's see if the fourth kingdom of Daniel 2 also lines up with this fourth kingdom, that is the fourth beast of Daniel 7. Look at Daniel chapter number 2 and look at verse 40. So this would correlate with the legs and the feet. That is the fourth kingdom. Look at Daniel 2 verse 40. It says, in the fourth kingdom shall be strong as what? Iron. Shall be strong as iron for as much. Why? As iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Not only is it mentioned as iron, it is also mentioned in the exact same way of, of what it's going to do, why it is being depicted as iron. Because this fourth kingdom that shall be upon the earth, what is it? It is strong as iron. The teeth are great like iron. And what does it do? It breaks in pieces. Both of them, the exact same description. It says it breaks in pieces and it subdues all things. So, so what does this line up with? It plainly and clearly lines up with fourth kingdom, fourth beast, strong as iron, exceedingly powerful, greater than all the other kingdoms, lines up with fourth kingdom, all of the same details here, which are the legs and the feet. Now, if we go back, so go over to Daniel chapter number eight, Daniel chapter number eight, and you just kind of get your eyes on it. We're not going to read a particular uh, uh, verse here in Daniel chapter number eight, but I want you to see this, you know, connection here with Daniel chapter number eight. And you see, well, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, Daniel chapter, it is Daniel chapter number eight. Be, be ready to flip from Daniel eight to Daniel seven. Because we're told something about, about this particular goat. It says that there are the four horns, but then it says something takes place when he's watching with the four horns. Remember, the great horn is broken off the head of the goat. In its place, four come up. But then he says also, what happens? Something happens at that time too. What does it say? He says, I considered, and he says, I don't know what verse it is. You can try to find it. It says, but a little horn comes up. Anybody know where it's at? So you can maybe point your fellow church members to it. Anybody see it in Daniel 8 where it says the little horn came up in Daniel 8? Verse 9. So on the head of the goat, you have the four horns, right? Which, so this represents Grecia. And then what comes out of that is the little horn grows up. Okay? Now you're, you're there in, in Daniel chapter number 8. Look over at Daniel chapter number 7. Now, where did Rome come from? 
What culture, what people, who did it conquer? Where did Rome come from? Greece. Greece. Rome came out of Greece. There's a reason why they still spake Greek. They spake Latin, but they also spoke Greek. Okay, they had Greek culture. They were Greeks. They were Greeks. They rose and came out of Grecia. Look at Daniel chapter number 7, verse number 8. It says this, I considered the horns. This is on the fourth beast, which is the fourth kingdom. It says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Now watch this. Before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. Now, in Daniel chapter number 8, we're told within the kingdom of Grecia that there are four horns. There are four horns on its head, but then a little horn arises. Okay? Do you know where that little horn arose from? Out of one of the four horns. Rome came up out of, out in the west, out where Greece is. I can't remember which was located where, but it came up out of what is and formed into Grecia. So, uh, I'm sorry, um, not Grecia, but one of the four kingdoms of Greece at that time when it was divided into the four emperors. Rome just kind of came up and it overtook the one kingdom and it existed for a period of time. And then guess what it went and did? Rome went and mightily and greatly and easily conquered the other three horns that were there. The other three generals that were there. And it plucked up the other three horns by the roots. That's why in Daniel 7, when we're given more details, the little horn comes up out of a totally different kingdom and beast. This is meant to tell you that that little horn arises ultimately from Greece from one of the horns, and it plucks up the other three horns out of or by the roots. It, one of the horns, destroys the other three kingdoms. So you see the little horn on the fourth kingdom here, and then you see it arising and defeating the other three and becoming that fourth kingdom. Now, ways in which you can, you can line this up to show that this is the case, and that's what it's referring to, number, four, number one, you just have the little horn being discussed. In both passages, the little horn is a specific man who persecutes the saints. You can compare this in Daniel 8 and Daniel 7. It's The little horn is, is meant to represent one man of that kingdom. The little horn comes up here, and it's meant to represent one man of that kingdom. Now, somebody already figured it out. When I typed in right here, you know, I was looking up four horns with a little horn. I think that's what I typed in on Google. Okay. Uh, in, in his image, it has all the four names of the other four kingdoms, but then this one that I haven't read, can you guys see that that's colored? You can see the lines red, but I also have the horn, the little horn colored red. They have written on their Rome. So, so this person understood what it was. That, that is the fourth kingdom that is Rome. And the little horn is meant to particularly represent one king of that kingdom as well. Remember, it will represent a king and a kingdom. When we're given more details, it's a totally different beast, right? It's a totally different monster. It's the fourth kingdom, okay? And on the head of that, what comes up? A little horn comes up on that fourth kingdom. Now, the, um, it, it, you know, the things that the little horn does over here are the exact same things that, like I mentioned, that the little horn does here. Guess what he does? In, in, uh, in Daniel chapter number 8 and Daniel chapter number 7, like I said, he persecutes the saints, but he has a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. He, he also, uh, it, says, it says that the little old horn has the eyes of a man, right? And then it mentions his mouth after that, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. It's the same horn. It's on this kingdom here, the fourth kingdom, which is after Grecia, which this lines up with. But what you have is the transformation taking place here. And it just leaves it on the head of Grecia. I hope everybody's getting that. I'm not beating a dead horse into the point where you're getting confused. But that's what's being discussed here. Now, furthermore, that's, that's not where it ends. Because I want you to look at Daniel chapter number 8, verse 9. And I can show you even an, an additional connection between this little horn being Rome. Look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 9. It says, and out of one of them came forth, that's out of one of the four, comes forth a little horn. So it's almost like the little horn grows out of the side of the other ones and it plucks up the other three. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. It becomes its own new empire, new kingdom. 
Okay, and it says, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven and cast down some of the host and, and to the stars and of the stars to the ground and watch this, stamped upon them. That is the same language that was used as we saw just a moment ago in Daniel chapter number seven and Daniel two. For who? The fourth kingdom. It says that he stamps upon them and he breaks them to pieces. It says that he the, the, that the feet, isn't it interesting that it's the feet here? And what does it say? See how the anatomy works out so perfectly? And he stamps upon them. Now, furthermore, remember how I mentioned how the anatomy is just so precise. It's amazing how the duality of the two. How many horns are on the head here of the fourth kingdom? Do you guys remember? How many horns total before the little horn comes up? Well, there's, there's four, but the, the head of the, remember the seven dragons has, four, has how many horns? Ten horns. How many toes are on your feet? Ten. So that's how the anatomy, you have the two, but you get down to the feet, and it mentions the toes to kind of draw your mind to it. So the toes are included in this image. You have the ten horns that grow out of the heads, but you get down to the feet, and how many, how many you know, toes are on your feet that's a part of that fourth kingdom? I hope that you're, you know, everybody's not one to answer. I hope you have ten toes. It would be ten toes representing what? The ten kings. The ten kings of that what? Of that fourth kingdom. So just point after point after point lines up perfectly. So you see the connection with the, each of actually, that's the, that would be the fourth kingdom. Now, what you have following that is right after the fourth kingdom in each of these is, look at Daniel chapter number seven, verse, verse nine, you have the demise of the beasts, okay? And don't screw up the timing here because this happens very often where he kind of rapidly moves forward to another event. And the way that you can prove this is because he retells it three times. He retells the story three times. If you look at 9 through 12, you have the destruction of these beasts, okay? And I will go back and explain this later, but it rapidly moves forward to Judgment Day, right? He says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. The judgment was set, so he just shoots forward to Judgment Day, right? Okay? But... However, don't allow that to confuse you because when he tells, when he tells the destruction of the fourth kingdom r the other times, it says that the kingdom of, is given to the saints. Now, we know that judgment day happens right before the eternal state is ushered in. And there, but there's a period of time before that of the kingdom where the saints reign. That leads up to that time period. Okay? And that would line up with all of that. So sometimes it just kind of rapidly moves forward. But look at verse 13. So we're going to continually, after the fourth kingdom, what kingdom comes in? The kingdom of God. What all of this is building to, at the time of the fourth kingdom, the kingdom of God comes in. Look at verse 13. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Now, the, the fourth kingdom is, is destroyed, okay? And it falls apart just like what? Just like the third kingdom did just like the second kingdom did, just like the first kingdom did. However, when the kingdom of God is set up, the kingdom that is given to the Son of Man is set up, what happens then? What takes place then? It's a kingdom that shall not be destroyed. That's the point that's being made. Each of these four beasts, they all are destroyed. The, go the ram falls to the goat. The, the, you know, the head of gold is destroyed. It falls. But ultimately and finally, at the time of the fourth beast, at the time of the fourth kingdom on the earth, there will be a kingdom that is set up that shall never be destroyed. Now, don't misunderstand this because it's not saying that he comes in cl with clouds to earth. It says, look at verse 13, because many people misunderstand this. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came where? To the Ancient of Days. Where is the Ancient of Days seated? Where is the Ancient of Days? In heaven. The Ancient of Days is in heaven. He says he comes 
to the Ancient of Days, and when he comes to the Ancient of Days, it's given to him what? A kingdom and power and glory and dominion and what? And he shall reign forever and ever. Let me ask you a question. When was Christ given the kingdom? When was it handed to him? When was the official moment? At the resurrection, yes, that's true. That's what he ultimately did is decisively finished. But I would say more specifically at the moment when he sat down at the right hand of the Father. That is the time in which it was solidified. It's when he came to the Ancient of Days and at that moment when he sat down at the right hand of the Father, that's what that signifies, him being sat at the right hand of the Father, is that he is sitting there and he is now seated where according to Acts 2? He is seated in the throne of David, the Davidic throne. It is fulfilled at that moment, at that point in time. And he's given a kingdom and a nation, and he has made him both Lord and Christ. That's when the kingdom officially would have come in, at that moment. It's at the time, what does it say? It says that, and I totally agree with that, Brother Hall. It happens, you know, oftentimes things like that happen in phases. What is the gospel? The death, the burial, the resurrection. Christ is paying for our sins on the cross, but is it totally complete yet? Well, he has to rise still from the dead, okay? It says that during the time of the fourth kingdom, the stone comes and smites the, the image on the feet and destroys it. It's during the time of this you know, a period of kingdoms that reigns on earth, and it's passed down. It says that during the time of the fourth beast, which is the fourth kingdom that lines up here, that's when the Son of Man is given the power. Look, at, uh, look further with me at verse number... Look at verse number 17. We read this a little bit earlier. In, in Daniel chapter number 8, verse number 17. <clears throat> These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then would I know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devour, break, devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell. Even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them. Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Let me ask you a question. We'll, we'll continue to read this because I want to read the next part. But right there, you already have the answer. At what time period does the kingdom come in and the saints possess the kingdom? The time of the fourth kingdom. It's handed from the fourth beast, from the fourth kingdom to who? To the saints. To, obviously, the son of man. Okay, The Son of Man is given the dominion, but the saints rule within the Son of Man's kingdom. That is Christ. Son of Man is Christ. Okay, uh, verse number 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall, and shall devour the whole earth and tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first and shall subdue three kings. Notice that. He subdues the three kings here in the head of the goat. Okay? Um, and uh, verse 25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given, in, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and dividing of the time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. Verse 27, and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. I want you to notice the language there. Now we clearly see, first of all, let's say this. We clearly see that the kingdom is the power of the kingdom of the earth is transferred from the fourth beast, who is Rome, 
to the Son of Man or to the kingdom of God? Directly. The fourth beast, who is the fourth kingdom over here, that's where that's when the power, that's when the stone comes and smites the kingdom, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the feet of the image. And then at that point, all the power is given to the Son of Man. But secondly, I want you to notice a key point that it continually says. Did you notice how it's worded at the moment of the, of the, the, the transfer of power? We see that the Son of Man comes to heaven. He, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and it's given to him dominion and power and authority. But there's an interesting wording that is used each time there. Did you notice two different times when it speaks about the kingdom on, on earth? It says, until the saints possess the kingdom. It says that the saints took the kingdom. Isn't that interesting? So let me ask you a question. Where is the Son of Man, where is the Messiah seated while the saints possess the kingdom? In heaven on the throne. When he ascends to heaven, he receives power and dominion and glory. He's king now. I mean, that's an indisputable fact of, of Scripture. We're told, he told his disciples before he sent them out, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. He was the king of all nations at that time. Now, all nations may not have bowed their knee yet, but he was their king. And that's why he's told, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So notice that the process of making his enemies his footstool continues while he's seated. And guess who is on earth and who has the kingdom during that time? The saints. Guess what? We can do the same thing over here. During the 70 weeks, it says, obviously it's all fulfilled in the 70th week, but during the 70 weeks, guess what takes place? The kingdom is built to the Messiah. That's what Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 say. The kingdom is built to the Messiah, and it says that during that time period, the Messiah will be anointed. What does that mean? Who is it? He's called Messiah the Prince. All of Isaiah speaks of him as the king, the king of David. That's who we're waiting, the seed of David, to come and rule and to restore all things. That's who we're waiting for. That didn't happen exactly like the Jews thought it was going to happen. Okay? But those that truly had faith in him, they believed him when he came. You line up each of these, the order is exactly the same. And they, they, have a, they correlate and correspond with each other perfectly. See what that means? During the time of the fourth kingdom, which was Rome, that's when the kingdom of God came in. That's when the kingdom of Christ came to the earth, and that's the time in which the saints possess the kingdom. Now, the nature of the kingdom might look a little bit different than what you had previously thought. Just like the Israelites, when, they, when, when Jesus is ascending to heaven, what was the question that they asked? Right before he ascends to heaven in Acts chapter number one, they ask him a question. Does anybody remember? When will these things happen? When are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the time, nor, nor the, the season that the Father has. But you know, it's interesting what he says, but go preach the gospel to all nations. Do you know how the kingdom comes in? It starts like a stone and it grows until it fills all the earth, we're told in Daniel chapter two. It's like leaven. The kingdom of God is like leaven. You put it in three meals, a large amount, and it slowly works its way through the, the, the meal, the lump, until the whole is leavened. How is, what is the kingdom of God like? It's like a mustard seed. What is it? What is a mustard seed? He tells you. It's a small. It's, it's the smallest of all the seeds of the earth. When you plant it, it grows into the largest. And what is it implying? It says all the, the fowls of the air come and make its nest in it. It starts out small, and then it grows into all the earth. It grows to fill all the earth. When did the kingdom of God come in? At the time of the fourth kingdom. According to all three visions. So that rock that came that smote the, the image on the feet, I know this was a little bit heavy, but we'll break some of these into pieces. Uh, and, and kind of look at them slowly over time. But that rock, that stone that came that smote the feet of the image, that's exciting. That took place when Christ came and he was cut off and he died for the sins of the world. And he ascended to heaven 
And he defeated all enemies. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power. And it's exciting to know that the kingdom starts off like a stone and then it grows into a great mountain until it fills all the earth. How does that happen? It happens by the disciples going out into all the earth. And that's you going out and preaching the gospel to all nations. Going out and preaching the gospel to your neighbor and to all people. How does it occur? And, and you know what? Here's the thing. What has happened, as I mentioned the other night, I mean, that's an amazing prophecy when you understand this of Scripture and a proof, a proof that this is the Word of God. It started off with John the Baptist. It started off with Jesus Christ. It started off with 12 disciples, and then he had 70. And what happened? It started off as a stone, a cornerstone. That's speaking of the Son of Man. And it is truly, in comparison to then, from then until now, it is growing into a mountain that will one day fill all the earth. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for many of these things. And, and, and uh, one of the things that makes these topics difficult, yeah, they're detailed. They're here for us, so we need to learn them, obviously. And they're revelations for us, and we're, we're, we're supposed to, to study all Scripture. But one of the things that makes it difficult is that they're new things. And we have to change some of the things that we believe. But nonetheless, help us not to give lip service like many people do, saying that we, that we love God's Word and that we'll change. And we just, you know, we love it because it's God, God's Word. Unfortunately, many times, uh, people have a loyalty to the doctrines of men, the doctrines of their denomination, the, de the doctrines of the people that, you know, they, they like to rub elbows with and that they're friends with. Help us, dear Lord, to have truly our loyalty to the Word of God and to love it even if we have to change something, even if it's different than what we believe. Help us to, and, and, and truly and really, the way in which you do things is so much more glorious than we could ever imagine. Help us to embrace teachings when we see that they're new. Help us to study these things out and to want to learn and to love your word and not to be, grow weary of it and tired of it and not to uh, desire to dive into these deep things. But give us understanding. Give us a mind that can learn them. We love you so much. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.